Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Order my steps in your word. Thank you, Brother Nate. Getting us started this morning. Good morning to everybody. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord on another Sunday in the month of December, year of our Lord 2021, the last Sunday of this year. The last Sunday of the year. Where did the year go? Where did the time go? Wow. The good thing is that we're still here. And I've heard of several home goings this week. Went to one funeral and probably could have gone to one every day if I had just wanted to go to funerals this week because there have been many. But God has blessed us, spared us to still be alive. And I am most happy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I'm not going to prolong the time today. It is the last Sunday, and I know that a uh, few of us never did finish up our Christmas shopping, and you want to get on out there and catch those sales. So I'm going to go ahead and invite the Spirit of God into this house, and, and we're going to tell you what the Lord has said and, and let you do whatever it is that you need to do. I know if you're like me, you got a few leftovers from your dinner from either yesterday or the Christmas Eve or sometime. I don't think very many folk are going to cook today. Uh, if you ain't got no leftovers, just go to your neighbor's house. <laughs> There's going to be plenty around somewhere. Uh, come on by my house. I got, I got enough for somebody. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you now for this opportunity, for this time together this morning, God. I thank you for seeing us through the Christmas holiday, the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And I pray that every soul understood what the celebration was all about. And God, it wasn't necessarily about chicken and, and ribs and shrimp and all of those good things on the table, the turkeys and hams and collard greens. It wasn't about all of that. It was about Jesus. And I pray that every soul worshiped and praised him on yesterday morning. If no other day of the year, certainly yesterday morning. And if they didn't, Lord, I pray that you'll touch their hearts right now, that they'll do it right now in spirit and in truth. And I also pray this morning, God, that you'll continue to bless every family that's represented in this church family and in your Christian community all across the globe. Touch us, God, and help us to all fully understand that you're still God all by yourself, that you don't need no help governing your, your world, and that Jesus is still Lord of the church. It still belongs to him. I thank you, God, for all of these, my brothers and sisters who are tuned in today, wherever they may be, and I pray that your word will go afresh and anoint every household that it goes into and give everybody a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. I bless you, I praise you, I magnify you, I glorify you, and I lift you up, Lord. So now come, preach your Holy Spirit. Tell the world what you'd have them know. I'm your vessel, Lord, I'm just an instrument to your service, so I pray that you'll humble me now. Let me down into your deep well of wisdom, crown me with the knowledge and understanding, and give me, give, loose my tongue, Lord, that the words will flow like a, a rushing river, and that your people will understand what you are saying to your church. Thank you now. Use me in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Sunday morning. Man. I, I, I just marveled this morning as I 
as my eyes came open about 5.30 and I was thinking, where did the time go? We were just celebrating Christmas last year, seemingly a couple of months ago, and here it is again. Matter of fact, it's not here anymore, it's already gone. And it's amazing how fast time is winding up. Let's go to our scripture this morning. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 22 through 35. Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 22. And Luke is recorded as having said, when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it's written in the law of the Lord. Every male that openeth the womb uh, shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons and behold there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon and the same man was just and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Ghost was upon him and it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ and he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the, Christ, the, the child Jesus to do for him after the customs of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. And for a sign which shall be spoken against, yea, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Amen. The word of God for the people of God. I pray that you'll pray and meditate upon these words as we go forth into our message today. Uh, we're going to speak from the subject waiting on the Lord waiting on the Lord well it's the Sunday after Christmas and most of us are either broke or we'll be broke by the time we get through buying after Christmas ornaments and it's going to be payday before we can start paying off some of these credit cards. Uh, try to catch up the bills. You know, sometimes we skip the light bills, hoping that the folks won't turn the lights off so we can buy a little Johnny a toy or something. At any rate, preachers go through some changes too. This time of the year, Christmas is over, Advent is done. Last Sunday of the year, and we wonder whether we should preach uh, the end of the year sermon or the beginning of the New Year sermon or just another Christmas sermon. We don't know what to preach. <laughs> and I've preached a little bit of all of those. But this year I feel led in a different direction. I, I, I want to examine some these scriptures that may not be traditionally associated with the Christmas message, but these things happen immediately following the birth of Christ. So we don't know much about Jesus' childhood because there are only a, a, a small number of verses that even deal with his childhood at all. So 
we're going to just examine one of these passages. Um, so, so, so with our focus on Christ this morning, the story of the text is that we have a very young child. It's Christ's child. By Jewish customs, uh, 40 days after you were to bring the child down to the temple and, and, um, and, and present him to the Lord. So Jesus was probably about 40 days old. And there was this old man whose name was Simeon who is near the end of his life, but he's there waiting. Two different generations and a remarkable meeting that was orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. And so the theme of our sermon today is waiting. If there's a thread that goes through this thing, it's going to be about waiting. And every last one of us know what waiting is all about. Some of us were in line Christmas Eve until the stores closed, waiting to pay for that last little item that we thought we just had to have in case somebody showed up and you didn't have another gift. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I know, I know. I was probably in one of them lines too. <laughs> but I read this, this little article about waiting and I found it kind of interesting. I don't know how scientific it is, but I found it really good reading. And, 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 and what it said was, uh, it talked about assuming, of course, that we live to be in our upper 70s or maybe our early 80s. This is how we wait or spend our time. It said, you'll spend over four years in a vehicle before you pass away waiting to get somewhere. All right? You'll spend two and a half years cooking, waiting to eat. It said you'll spend 25 years sleeping, waiting to get up. You'll spend 10 years clocked in at work, waiting for the day when you don't have to work no more. And then it says something real interesting, and, and you know I don't like getting it on these sides right here, so y'all take this with a grain of salt. It, said, it says that women may spend over two years in the bathroom. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I, I can't tell you about that. I'm just talking about the article I read. So don't hold this one against me. <laughs> and it also said that men spend about two years in the bedroom waiting on his lady to get gussed up. I'm just talking about the article. <laughs> Y'all know what gussed up mean. Well, the same article somehow figured out that women may spend an entire year of their lives just trying on dresses and seeing what they're going to wear on that particular day. Now, I'm assuming that they must try on three or four different outfits before they choose one. <laughs> and of course, uh, all of us, depending on what doctor, dentist, or ologist, or specialist you have to deal with, after you get over 60, you could spend a year or so in waiting rooms. Amen? Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. But let's talk about Simeon. He knew how to wait. Now, the scripture says in verse 25 that there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, righteous people know what to wait upon. We're not in control of our lives. Righteous folks already know that. We know that we are not in control of our life. Now, if if you're on the other side of righteousness, then, hey, you on your own. But righteous folks know that. Simeon didn't know exactly what he was waiting to see. He didn't know uh, 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 when it was going to arrive. He didn't know the answer to what he was waiting and depending on. But he was a righteous man, and he knew how to wait on the Lord. He knew how to let God be in control. Waiting is a topic that's often talked about in the Bible. And I'm going to read you a few verses that, 
that mention uh, waiting. Just a few of them because the Bible is loaded. Lamentations 3 and 25 says the Lord is good to those who wait on him. He's good to those who wait on him, to the souls who seek him. Isaiah 40 and 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Micah 7 and 7 says, But as for me, I look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Psalm 62 and 5 says, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. And finally, Galatians 5 and 5 says, For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Just a few scriptures that talks about waiting on the Lord. And so, from my first point today, I, I might ask the question, what are you waiting on? What are you waiting for and who are you waiting for? Many of us perhaps go from place to place and from occasion to occasion in life, from happiness to happiness, or as we might say biblically, from fountain to fountain. But what we discover is that all of the fountains eventually run dry. All of them. There's only one that keeps on giving, and that fountain is Jesus. And that's where we find Simeon. Simeon was a righteous, devout man who was waiting on the Lord. So let's talk about him just a little bit no, a little bit more. He, he, he knew what he was waiting on. Verse 25 says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. I read that again. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Verse 26 says, And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So we don't know much about Simeon. This particular fellow is only mentioned here in this scripture. We don't know how much prophecy he had been exposed to. We don't know if... He had any preconceptions about the Messiah, what he looked like. All we know is that the man had the Holy Ghost on his life, was righteous and devout, and was likely at the end of his life, physically. We've already established that this guy who, who, who knew how to wait, he, 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 he knew that waiting on the Lord was how to wait. Work with me. So what is he waiting upon? Who was it that he was waiting for? Those two, what and who? And we're gonna talk about those for, for just a moment or two. The what first. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. We're talking about a new covenant. We're talking about the Masonic age, the Messiah, uh, Messianic age, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. We are, we are talking about the great event that was happening, that hopes could be reborn, that sin could be forgiven, and that souls could be atoned for. This was one of the greatest times in history just to be alive. It was worth waiting for. For Luke and his readers, it might have been easy to assume that this would involve being delivered from their enemy, Rome. Rome was a great oppressor. It could mean uh, getting a king from the lineage of David who would free them from the Rome's rule again. It would have been easy for Simeon and for Luke and for Israel to get, get a picture in their head of what they ought to wait for instead of waiting for God's promise. Sometimes we get a little ahead of ourselves. Don't we do that? Do we get in our heads that we ought to wait for things instead of simply waiting on the promises of God? What do some of us as believers wait for? Well, let me tell you, I know. We wait on a good family, a good spouse. We wait on a nice job, a stable career. 
We wait on a, 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 a financially solid retirement. And praise the Lord. Some of us receive that and more. But those things aren't necessarily God's will for everybody. And they are certainly not all that God would accomplish in my life and hopefully in your lives either because there's a whole lot more that goes along with this. Sometimes waiting on God is not going to be a peaceful venture. Sometimes it, require, it requires trust and faith and yes, it requires extra strength. So we got to stay on our knees just a little bit longer. Just like the writer said, those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Simeon was waiting for the amazing, and some would even say for the impossible. I don't think the Pharisees and Sadducees ever expected a Messiah to show up. But his goal was to follow God and to see the Christ, which brings us to the who he was waiting on. See, the who, he, he was waiting for the Lord's Christ. The Lord's Christ. What he was waiting for was fulfilled by the who he was waiting for. Did y'all get that? Y'all follow me? What he was waiting for was fulfilled by the who he was waiting for. Verse 27 says, and he, and he came in the spirit into the temple, and, and, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the customs of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for mine eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles. And for glory to your people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother. Behold this child is appointed for a fall and a rising of many in Israel. And for a sign that's opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul. So the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. It's important to note that we get a whole lot of what's and when's. I'm going to bag that up a minute. We get a whole lot of what's and when when we wait on the Lord. And both of them come together usually. <clears throat> Let me give you an example. Well, when I get older, I'm going to travel the world with my dream spouse. Well, that's the what. When my kids grow up, I want some grandchildren. What's and when? When I get my act together, I'll get serious about serving and praising and worshiping God. Well, now. What's and whens. We make a whole lot of terms and conditions with God, don't we? Some of us make lots of empty promises and, and follow those up with a life full of excuses. Well, Lord, I woulda, I coulda, and I shoulda. And I understand that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Simeon understand, understood that to see the what, he'd have to meet the who. That waiting for the consolation of Israel was only possible through Jesus Christ. Seeing Israel, seeing Israel achieved all of those things that was promised in the Old Testament was not the goal of Simeon. He didn't care about that. That was not his goal. His goal was meeting Jesus. And there's a difference. Pastoring a growing church. Pastoring faithfully over a long period of my life. Having children that grew up in the Lord. Visiting the Holy Land. Being healthy and losing weight here and there. These are life goals for folk like me. 
whole lot more of you out there too, not just preachers, doing whatever it is that you do. Life goes, but none of these what's hold a bit of weight if you haven't met Jesus. They ain't worth nothing. I don't care what you do. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know Jack. Amen. It all starts with Jesus. The Holy Spirit led Simeon not to a time in which Rome was conquered. Not to a time in which Israel had this great king on a white horse. But to a time in which he met the Lamb of God as a baby. The Holy Spirit will lead you to meet Jesus as an adult now. But he led Simeon while this child was still a baby. Let me say it plainly. None of my goals matter. None of your goals matter. They're all worthless unless you know Jesus personally. Because you're on your way to hell. And it ain't gonna matter. He is the one worth waiting for. We may spend a year, two years in the bathroom. We may, we may spend four years riding around in our vehicles or ten years on a job or uh, 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 whatever but a life lived waiting for Christ is a life in which the waiting will not be in vain I've seen people working right here at Central State Hospital on their 34th year getting ready for retirement and get fired All of those years were in vain. I've seen folk retire, waiting to enjoy the good life, sit on the front porch and die. All of that waiting was in vain. You need Jesus in your life. Simeon was anticipating death, but he found life. Listen, verse 26. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he wouldn't see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. Lord, verse 29, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The slow march of time goes onward for all of us. We just live through another Christmas. And the older we get, the more we realize that we are just mortal creatures. We are flesh and blood. Heaven will not accept flesh and blood anymore. You're going to die. You're going to die. Simply that. You're going to die. Hmm. Lord have mercy. I pray that you're not afraid of death. I pray that Jesus is a part of who you are, that you have internalized him. Our, our bodies have already stopped working like they used to work. I don't know, but you know, I've been had this, this pain right here in this hip. And I've seen a lot of people lately who got that same pain, either in this hip or that hip, and the ones who don't have pain there that are over 60 got a pain in the knee or their shoulder or the elbow or their neck. Pains everywhere. And the ones who don't have pain there don't even know who they are. They got mental problems. <laughs> they don't know whether they're hurting or not. In other words, my brothers and sisters, we are falling apart. So we need to face.
face it. We're waiting to die. And you can put anybody else in there <laughs> that you want to put in there. Your business is waiting to die. Your church is waiting to die. Whatever. Many of us are waiting to die. They've given up to this rapid advance of time and are just waiting out their days trying to make do with what they've got. And I know that some of you know somebody just like that. I remind you of an age when God was calling people to go to work for him. Listen to me. We're senior citizens, most of us who are listening today. But God ain't through with you yet. Look at what he did. Moses and Aaron were called to, to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt at 80 and 83 respectively. They were old men. Joshua was given the charge of leading the conquest of Canaan, clearing the land. He was 80 years old and he did it for several of decades. Old man. God ain't through with you. Daniel was over 80 when they threw him in the lion's den. He wasn't done. Luke 1 and 7 tells us that Zacharias and, and Elizabeth was way past childbearing years when, when John the Baptist was born. And the list goes on. So church folk, the older we get, the more we wait on God. The more we can be used by God, the more we can influence younger people with our godliness. If we stop being fools ourselves and act like we are who we say that we are. If you're a child of God, then act like a child of God. Lord have mercy. I'm trying not to get worked up about this. We can have salvation. We can have salvation. We can tell somebody else about salvation. We can still be warriors for God. Simeon was waiting to see the embodiment of life eternal. It's ironic that the last thing he saw before his physical death was the sign of his eternal life. Listen to his reaction one more time. Verse 29. Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you've prepared in the presence of all people. A light for revelations to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Whether you're young or old, when we wait on the Lord, we can have peace. We can depart in peace. That is, peace in our relationship with our God because you go to depart anyway. We can have salvation because it's in Christ, in Christ alone that we're saved from eternal death into eternal life. We can witness the fulfillment of his promises in, and his preparation. We can go to, to, to that place where Jesus said he was going to prepare for us. John 14 says, I, 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 in my father's house are many mansions. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. But I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm looking forward to my place. When we meet Christ, as verse 32 says, we have a light for revelation, knowing that Christ Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God to man. And through Christ Jesus, we have the relationship restored between God and man. That's us and God. We keep trying to tear our relationships apart. And God keep trying to fix it for us. 
Simeon was an old man. He was an old man uh, who was waiting, but he knew how to wait. He recognized that being devout and righteous were, were tied to waiting upon God and his word and his promises and his will. He also knew what he was waiting on. He was waiting on the consolation of Israel. Those promises of God came to pass and God's promises never fail. They have either all come to pass or the ones that hadn't come to pass will be coming soon. He knew that what he was waiting on was dependent upon who he was waiting on. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the fulfillment of God's plan, the author and finisher of our faith, the author of the new covenant between man and God, whereby there was forgiveness for sin and salvation for every soul. Simeon was old. But he wasn't just sitting around waiting to die. He was at the temple waiting on the Lord, waiting to live. He met Jesus Christ. He saw him with his own eyes. This person who would later on say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except by me. Simeon, at the end of his days, when he would think about death, found eternal life. And we have that same choice before us today. It's our choice. Some of us physically need to find life again. We need to find purpose in waiting on God and waiting on God's will and, and God's calling for our lives. He didn't just leave you here on accident. You're sitting around thinking there isn't anything else for you to do. You better talk to God. If you're still breathing, there must be something more that you can do. When you run out of stuff for God to use you for, then he's going to take you out of here. There has to be something more. We can realize that God can do anything with anybody at any time. And we should always seek to make ourselves available available to our God a lot of folks spiritually dying or dead sitting around listening to me today we need to meet Jesus Christ and see God's word come to pass in our own hearts in our own lives instead of half hearted admiration of a man we need to do a full-hearted surrender before the Son of God. One day, we'll behold the same eternal wonderful life with God that Simeon found at the temple. I'm praying, I'm praying that none be lost, no not one. If you're waiting on the Lord then, talk to him and let him know. If you're still lost in sin, you need to come to him and invite him in. Pray with me. Father God, I ask you in the name of Jesus now to touch the souls of all who hear your word today, Lord. And for those who are lost and don't know you in the free parts of sin, I pray that you'll forgive them. Touch them and let them know that you're waiting on them. And for those of us, Lord, who are still holding on to your unchanging hand, Father, I pray that you'll tighten the grip and pull us closer to you. I thank you for this wonderful year. Thank you for this Great message this morning, Lord, and I pray that all his ears and hearts have heard and felt and will accept what you are saying through your word. I bless you. I love you, Lord. I magnify you. I glorify you and I lift you up. Bless us now as we go forth from this place. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you. God keep you is my prayer. I'll see you next year. Hallelujah.